Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Reasonable Doubt, sponsored by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. I'm your host, Jimmy Ardwan, and tonight we welcome Harris County District Clerk Chris Daniel, as well as Houston Chronicle reporter Lisa Falkenberg. It's been a big week in the legislature here in Texas with some sweeping reforms of the grand jury system, the open carry bills, concealed handguns on campuses, and a lot more that we're going to talk about tonight uh, with our guests and my co-host, Damon Parrish. We're going to be on the Twitter tonight at HCCLA underscore TV. Send us your questions. We're also going to open up the phone lines at 830. The number's on the bottom of your screen right now, 713-807-1794. I'll remind everybody again when we hit 830 to give us your calls for Chris Daniel and Lisa Falkenberg. But right now, I want to bring in my co-host, Damon Parrish. Damon, how are you? I'm doing, doing pretty well, actually. Doing pretty well. How about you? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm really excited about our guest tonight. It's going to be a good time. We've got a lot to talk about. A lot of sweeping changes here in Texas happened over the, the past couple days. And some of these bills, I think, have been signed. Some of them, I think, we're still awaiting Governor Abbott's signature, right? Right, right. It appears that, like always, a lot of bills were passed or pushed through, and he's yet to sign the ones we think are going to go through. So we can imagine that open carry is going to pass because he's pretty supportive of that. We can imagine that uh, the on-campus bill is going to pass. Uh, bills relating to the grand jury system, we're kind of hoping. Yeah. Right? Uh, cannabis oil bill. There's a lot of bills that we think may pass, may not pass. We'll just wait and see. Just waiting for his signature to see what happens. But let's bring in our guests here. right now. First, I want to welcome Harris County District Clerk Chris Daniel. Chris, thank you for joining us tonight. Happy to be here. Absolutely. And, of course, the woman of the hour. The Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for the Houston Chronicle, Lisa Falkenberg. Lisa, thank you. thank you for joining us. You were the only woman on this panel. You were brave to come so, in yeah. this week. <laughs> in the um, first, I want to I wanna jump to you, Lisa, because you were honored this week. Uh, the city of Houston gave you a proclamation, named it Lisa Falkenberg Day. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to compete with the Rockets a little bit, <laughs> but that's pretty cool. I mean, you, you, not a lot of people, nobody at this table that I know of has, has gotten a day named after them by the city. What was that like for you? Right. I came close. I came close. <laughs> <laughs> it almost happened, but I got beat by Lisa Falkenberg. <laughs> No, it was actually, I had a niece who said, so she's in college, but she's, do I have to go to school today? Can I even stay home? And I think that warrants a day <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was, it was a really nice honor and um, just good to know that I let everybody on council know this doesn't mean they're off the hook, you know, just because they're doing this nice thing for me. I'm still a journalist and you You're know, still if any of them, them step out of line, I'm yeah. keeping my eye on them. But um, it, it is nice to know that uh, the mayor and council members really um, acknowledge, I guess, the power of journalism and, and the change that, that could happen. And, you know, newspapers are still relevant and we're an important, the fourth estate is still a really important part of making sure that our, gov our government and our justice system is doing the right thing. And you're the first journalist in the history of the Houston Chronicle to win a Pulitzer right. Prize. So that's a pretty big deal, right. uh, especially in this town. I mean, it, it, we, it, you, you just mentioned how newspapers aren't dead. That has been the rhetoric that newspapers are dying, that we're losing uh, that, that arm of journalism. We're going to Twitter and blogosphere and all that sort of stuff. But uh, journalists like you are really helping keep that relevant, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I don't know. Do you, do you see an ability to somehow br bridge the gap between the two? Well, I mean, Lord help us if journalism dies. I mean, I, I don't right. think anybody thinks or, I mean, the, the United States of America cannot, this sounds so high and mighty, but we can't, the, this country cannot exist without a strong, um, I won't say newspapers, but without a strong media to keep watch on the people who are, you know, spending our money and administrating justice in this country. Um, the problem is that, frankly, newspapers haven't found a way to make enough money. We're still making quite a bit of money, but enough money um, to sustain. So all those classified ads we've kind of lost and, uh, you know, the subscriptions are dropping off. Even when newspapers don't exist, though, hopefully somebody will find a way to make this available online and, and come up with a business plan. I mean, that's the nitty gritty of it. You have to have a yeah. business plan that works. So hopefully yeah. somebody will solve that. They did it for music with iTunes. I mean, maybe somebody hopefully can find Hopefully somebody it. will do it with, uh, with newspapers as well. Well, <laughs> Lisa, you kind of mentioned something I want to ask you. you. You spoke of a difference between, I guess, print media or your, your media. Do you see a difference in like what you do in your journalism and something like blogs or Twitter or that, well, definitely not Twitter, but blogs and that kind of thing? Well, you know, when people mention Twitter, I think I'm on Twitter. You know, a lot of established, um, whatever you guys call the mainstream media is the favorite phrase. Um, a lot of the mainstream media is on Twitter. 
I mean, it's keeping Twitter afloat, probably, <laughs> originally. Chris Daniels um, on Twitter, too, right? That's right. At Chris Daniels, I can retweeted the event today. <laughs> so it is a way of getting our journalism out there. You know, it's not competing. It's, it's helping us, actually, um, helping us to compete uh, in the new world of social media. Now, blogs, I consider those, I mean, it, it depends. You know, if the person's doing a lot of reporting, obviously there's some great blogs, um, Grits for Breakfast, you know, you guys are very familiar with that one. Um, there are some great blogs out there where the, you know, person writing it is doing as much reporting as I do on a daily basis. And so it really depends. But, right. you know, the more information, the better, as long as it's valid and So where well, do you think well the future of print media is going? Do you think there's a state, do you, do you think there's still a niche market for a newspaper or is that a smaller market? Is it going towards blogs? I mean, where do you think the future lies in print media? I mean, I think that, um, you know, pr print media will always exist, but someday it will be all online. That's really what I think. I mean, um, the presses, you know, will not run forever <laughs> with newspapers. And I don't think my bosses would be happy for me to say that, but it, it's, truth, it's true. Truth hurts sometimes. And um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of major newspapers that are going to a digital first format, you know? I mean, I think the New York Times has made tremendous strides in um, building its its readership online. Everybody realizes that's where we're headed. And every time I speak, you know, I have readers who really love their paper and love to hold it. And every morning, you know, it's part of their ritual. And they ask me, how much longer is the paper going to gonna keep arriving? And I don't know. I mean, an oracle. But I just... Um, I know that you know that that is where we're headed, but hopefully it doesn't mean that the, the journalism, the print journalism, is any any less than what it is now. And hopefully it's more than what it is now. I mean, there's so many. Um, really, there are so many. There's so much research that actually shows uh, that people are reading now more than they ever did. Sure. Um, what we're reading is some uh, somewhat of a concern if we're able to aggregate our news these days. You know, we're not faced with the diversity of a front page that includes stories maybe we're not interested in, we didn't realize we were interested, people of different walks of life whose stories are yeah. represented there. Now we're able to pick and choose what we read, and so it's it's so much easier to pick and choose only the opinions what that agree want. with ours. And what you, and the big thing is going after what you want. Yeah. Speaking of technology, Chris, since you have become district clerk, you have made, I would say, you know, tremendous strides in improving the technology here in Harris County. And I, I want to thank you for that as a practicing lawyer every day. And I'm sure everybody who is watching who is a practicing lawyer thanks you that, for that. What the people who are not lawyers at home may not know exactly what you've done since you've taken office. Kind of walk us through some of the big things that you have done since taking office as the Harris County District Clerk. Well, let me preface that with say that a lot of these were initiatives that began under previous district clerks that either took place right as they took office or that I helped carry forward and expanded upon. So for example, the website itself, which for the audience at home is www.hcdistrictclerk.com, you can now search virtually any public case online in Harris County, so long as it's not confidential or sealed or taken off because of a judicial order, it is available online, including special minutes. And that is so powerful for a practicing attorney and for the public that may want to represent themselves in that they don't have to come all the way down to the courthouse to search for any of these documents. They can get them online. But not just the court records themselves, but we've expanded the ability to reschedule your jury service online. So that, for example, if one of our producers happens to have jury duty later on in the week, they can actually go online, reschedule that jury service, and then put it out to an available date in the future so that they can still serve. We get the benefit of their service. And not only have we put technology online, but we've put histor historic documents online. So all the historic records that were initially restored under Charles Bakaris are now available, digitally scanned, online for the public to search at any time. So your offices, you keep offices at the, your main offices are at the civil courthouse, the new right. civil courthouse on Caroline, but you do keep offices within the criminal courthouse, the juvenile courthouse, the family, well I guess the family now is in the civil courthouse. Most of the family is in the courthouse, but Still for those of you that practice CPS and Title IV D cases, you'll know that uh, the four statutory uh, appointed judges are still there in the family law building, but also the new jury assembly building. And if you were to look at the the complex from uh, Skyview, it makes kind of like a plus sign. You have the criminal, civil, family, juvenile, and jury in the middle to tie it all together. Right. 
And yes, we have offices in all five buildings. You talked about making it easier for people who want to represent themselves. And, sure. And, and a lot of people, obviously, what you know, a lot of people can't afford attorneys. That's a big controversy. On the criminal side, we get them. Uh, we have a, a mechanism in place now in Harris County where people can get either a public defender or get uh, a, a lawyer appointed for them if they qualify. But I wonder because one of the big big issues that we're having, and the American Bar Association writes about it a lot, is the problems with indigency on the civil side. What is your office doing to help people just in basic landlord-tenant actions or other civil cases that they might otherwise be able to represent themselves on? Well, if the case falls in one of my 90-plus judges, and it's not a county court at law case or a JP case, uh, what we do is we either direct them to the law library, which is now conveniently not only in the civil building itself, but has a beautiful brand new library at the base of the county attorney's building. But uh, we also have uh, uh, various uh, uh, tabs on the website where we can direct them to forms and to resources for free legal services. Because while our office itself cannot give legal advice, we are free to direct people to as many free legal aid societies, profit, nonprofit, uh, as possible so that the viewer has the choice either to hire an attorney or to have these available resources to, at their fingertips to try to represent themselves. That's for the attorneys pushing the technology has been key because if we make it easier, faster, and cheaper for the attorneys to practice, then we're making the bills cheaper for the ultimate party user. Well, and you were giving me a tour of it before we went on air, and a lot of the, the stuff with the DWI videos now up on, on the website, kind of a, I guess you guys have a sharing system now with the district attorney's office, correct. whereby defense lawyers can go on and get access to their client's file if they're attached to the case, correct? But it's no secret that prior to my Democrat predecessor, the defense bar was kind of a redheaded stepchild of any district clerk, and I'm speaking in generalities now, and so the both of us have and no tried... no offense to Ms. Falkenberg, who actually yeah, is... no offense to the redhead That's okay. on, <laughs> on the set tonight. The, hope, hope you're not offended but by the that. Both of us, <laughs> We're the last constituency you're able to offend. Well, but the, the both of us have, have uh, uh, both clerks have uh, tried to reach out to the fence bar in a positive way to find new ways to bridge that gap that has traditionally been observed to be true, whether it's true or not, to be observed to be true, that the... That the prosecution side usually was favored with the new toys and new gimmicks and so forth, whereas the defense bar was always having to play catch up. And so for the first time, we're trying to bridge that gap where the defense bar has equal access to everything. And it's not just the Michael Morton Act where they're kind of forcing the hand of that, but it's allowing technology to just give everybody an equal playing field so that you have those DWI videos readily to hand. You're not having to bother somebody, is it, is it ready yet, is it ready yet, is it ready yet? So that you have those documents, those charging instruments, the available data that the uh, opposing counsel has that you now have. And we've got a picture so, of the home screen up uh, right now so people can kind of see what it's like to you go to the go to the screen there and, and you've got all your options available to you. For attorneys you need a login and a password to be able to access some of the the image documents. Correct and the reason why we did that is uh, we still have to function as a government ag agency and so we charge the general public at large for copies of court records but we again trying to make it as cheap as possible for the attorneys to practice so for attorneys they can view and print uh, non-certified records for free so long as they have a bar registered login to the website so and then once they're logged in they get to see not only their uh, cases of a, of a record that they're tied to as an attorney but all the public cases where that's not necessary they get to see anything they need to in order to do research or practice all right so as the, a member of the general public non-attorney sure. what what information do they have access to via your website besides the general here's our address here's our location that, that sort of information all court records are essentially the public's record and that's how the founding fathers of the United States and of this state have uh, decided that these records are paid for by your taxpayer dollars and therefore if there's not a judicial reason to keep them confidential you should have access to them yeah. And so, unless, of course, if there's some reason, like there's maybe social security numbers or uh, names and, and, and addresses of, of minors in the document itself, in which case you would have to come physically to the courthouse to view that document, if there's no real reason to keep it of, uh, from you, we're going to make it available to you online, civil, family, criminal, 
not juvenile, right. but uh, in tax cases as well. What about a snoopy investigative journalist from right. the Chronicle who likes to write articles about things? Could she get access to this? <laughs> Especially Funny you should ask that. <laughs> There's a special minutes tab. Uh, uh, one of the uh, non-print journalist uh, outlets have figured out how they can actually go through and see a lot of the offense reports as they come in uh, to the county. And that, again, these are public records. They're not secret. And uh, a good journalist is able to use the website to their full advantage and find anything they need so they can do the full research and write their story. So Lisa, did you know that? Did you know you can go online? Yes, but I have a password issue. My password is always <laughs> expiring. <laughs> No, really, it's always expiring because you guys, I mean, you know, under Lauren, I know we're not supposed to na name sure. him, but under your Democratic predecessor, um, yeah, Lauren Jackson, he was, um, the, the media was included in the, um, you know, initial uh, folks who were able to get free copies, which is great, and we really, right. we appreciate that. Something's just, I don't know. Spaz we'll get it updated. My, uh, we'll get it my updated. Because we even hold workshops for new journalists. Uh, we uh, we try to come at least once a year to the Chronicle itself and to any other agency to train them on how to use the website because we do not want to be a barrier to justice. We do not want to be a barrier to open access to the public and to the media. One of the big questions I have, Chris, is last year the state of Texas mandated e-filing mm -hmm. in all civil cases, and we it, and that's great, and the system somewhat works occasionally. But um, with criminal cases, we kind of have this hodgepodge of free facts in the district courts here in Harris County, which is a form of e-filing, uh, not all the way e-filing. And then e-filing of subpoenas in the county courts um, where you, ca you can't file your motions or anything. When, when do we get full e-filing in criminal cases? It should be mandated for the state of Texas, July of 2017. And what we're working through with the process behind the scenes is most of the public aren't aware that there's an unelected agency called the Office of Court Administration that actually manages the judges themselves and the court coordinators in the courts, and as well as grand jury. We'll get to that later. Yeah. They also set the rules on how we interact as the custodian of the court records. And so, therefore, we have to work through those agencies on what rules will apply to the district courts and what rules will apply to the county courts at law. And that's really been the holdup in the criminal courts themselves. Uh, at the end of the day, we're ready to go electronic and criminal. The question is, is the defense bar ready, or is the state ready, and are the judges ready? But from the record-keeping side, we're ready to go. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned at the top of our show, this week was a landmark week in the state of Texas in terms of new bills passed. There were a lot of, of new bills that came to, through the legislature, through both the Senate and the House, that amazingly got the approval of both, both sides of our legislature and went on to Governor Abbott's desk. Some have been signed, some are still awaiting his signature. And guys, I, I want to take up kind of the first one that has gotten a lot of controversy here, in, or the, the main two, and it involves firearms. Um, because it's gotten a lot of attention with the Waco situation. And the first one is the open carry. It's gonna allow people with a concealed handgun license to now carry those handguns in a holster on their side openly from everyone to see. And Chris, I wanna to turn to you as the, as the Harris County District Clerk first because okay. there is an issue um, with I mean, courthouses, you shouldn't be carrying guns there, much less open uh, carry handguns. So let's get that out of the way first. But how do you think this is going to affect courthouse security? I think that uh, it actually won't apply to the courthouse because I think the same rules that prohibit you from carrying a, a concealed handgun to uh, various establishments will also apply even in open carry. What about around the courthouse facility? I mean, that, that's going to be a little bit tougher to enforce. they will be uh, definitely tougher to enforce. And I'm glad that we have Constable Rosen to uh, have having beefed up the security around the courthouses that you've probably observed as a practicing attorney. I'm glad that he has made that presence there, but at the end of the day, uh, a sane citizen today may be insane tomorrow based on a court ruling or based on what's going on in the courthouse and may decide that he has nothing or she has nothing left to lose. Uh, and you, it, it's a touchy subject because you'd think that more people would be polite to each other with open carry. but. That assumes that both parties are sane, 
And so when you're dealing with, particularly the criminal courthouse, we're dealing with a lot of folks that can be at times not of sound mind. And therefore, it, we are definitely worried about uh, what might happen at the courthouse. Well, if this I'll, I'll take a different approach on that. Sure. Uh, while it's concealed, I would actually be more afraid because you don't know who has a gun. And True. At least somebody with open carry, I can look and see this person has a gun on him. Uh, and law enforcement can better make a decision as to what to do. You, you, there's no question whether or not you're armed. But it's not armed. just on your belt. This also allows for imprinting so that if you have a right. concealed handgun and it happens to be sticking out of your jacket just a little bit, she may not see it at first glance, but that law enforcement will see it maybe. Right, which, which back to my point, with, with the current concealment law, you can't imprint, right? You can't. At all. So basically you have to wear baggy clothes or, you, or carry it in your purse, right, Lisa? Right. You have to have some way of holding on to a gun that nobody can see it. But at least with open carry, they, they, somebody will see it's there and will know you are armed and can better uh, act in accordance with you. I mean, is that, do you not agree with that? I, I do agree with that. But at the end of the day, if that party is insane for whatever reason, even if it's just temporary insanity because based on a court ruling or they just lost their child or they just, 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 uh, it wouldn't matter that the law enforcement sees them ahead of time. It wouldn't matter that you, the public, see them ahead of time. They're still firing that gun into the ground. But wouldn't that same person still have a gun on them if it was concealed? I guess that's my point. The, the, sure. the same person who might carry a concealed gun might carry an open carry gun, so the same rules of what they may or may not do might apply, but at least then you know that nut has a gun on them. Right? True, <laughs> true. It's just a little easier to reach there in the holster, I guess. <laughs> well, Lisa, Lisa right. what are your of thoughts on this? I mean, it, it, as, and let's, let's throw in the, the concealed carry on ha campus as well because the other bill that kind of goes in with this one is uh, Texas now said you can carry concealed handgun on college campuses and and I, I want to get your thoughts not from a, a legal perspective so to speak because all of us work in the in the legal field to some extent but just as a regular ordinary citizen does this do these laws cause you concern in any way and what people I are guess, not allowed to do I don't know I, I, I guess I feel it's it's silly to me. It's something that just happens in Texas because you know <laughs> we have to all be raw, raw guns, guns. Um, I don't like it. Uh, you know, when the folks at UT, when the folks at you know, several people spoke out about this and said that they didn't <clears throat> feel that this would be a safe thing for Texas to do, and instead, you know, well. It got passed regardless. One good thing is that it does allow uh, the version that got passed, as I understand it, does allow the um, university, the public universities, to choose which sections of campus that they'd like to have um, gun free. I do wonder what that's going to cost the universities to have some kind of metal detector or you know what what added security. I actually reached out to. You know, A&M, UT, and U of H this week, and didn't really get an answer on that. They're, it's very preliminary. Um, you know, they're, they're saying all of them said, "Has the governor even signed it yet?" And you're already asking questions about this, and it doesn't go into effect until what 2016, and then right. 2017 right. for the um, for the um, community colleges. But at the same time, though, I kind of have I kind of share your point. I mean, how much different is it than what's going on now? And really social norms being what they are. I mean, I know this is Texas, so things could be very different, but the fact is most of us have enough sense not to walk around with a gun and a holster on our hip because of what people might think of us, because the lady, you know, with a small child might grab her child or, or yeah. leave the McDonald's because you just walked in. I don't know. I, I would hope that people have enough sense not to, not to do this because it's kind of silly, but at the same time, I, I wonder really how much how much of a change it's really going to make in Texas. And I make that statement also in the sense that Texas isn't the first state to right. potentially legalize right. open carry. I think we're the 13th or 14th. So it's not like we are leading our, the, the cowboy charge into walking around with horses on our hips and, and uh, spurs on our boots. Right. Well, and, and uh, we've got a We've got one of the judiciary, one of the state judges, Ryan Patrick, is uh, following along with us, and he's tweeting us right here. Whoa. And uh, he's asking about the protests and speeches that people have made uh, with, re with regard to the long guns. What's the difference with that? Um, you know, Chris, uh, have, you, have you seen that? And what, what's your thought on what Judge Patrick is asking? Uh, he's probably talking about where when you go to one of the state conventions, you'll mm -hmm. see folks carrying a long rifle, uh, some of them that look like assault rifles, but they're not, right. uh, on their shoulders as they're outside and so forth. And uh, it's interesting when we go back to strictly the 
campus carry bill. Uh, when Charles Whitman got to the top of the tower at UT in the mid-60s, the first couple that came off of the observatory deck thought that he was there to shoot pigeons and thought nothing of the fact that he had a gun on him. And so one of the psychological things that could happen, and I'm, I'm now going to span it to both bills, is that you get used to the fact that somebody has a, a, a gun on them. Then you drop your guard, you drop your awareness, and then that could also lead to a situation where you would have run, you would have fled, you would have called somebody, you would have, hey, officer, so-and-so, uh, and then you don't because of that switch in psychology where you have decided, oh, well, well of course, he's there to shoot pigeons. Yeah, well, and the big controversy about this, Bill Damon, as you know, was getting the, the language in about whether or not police officers had the right to stop somebody uh, and question them solely because they were carrying an open concealed uh, an op I'm open concealed an open carry handgun and that language was added in at the last uh, uh, that's what finally got it through that that language was added in and I think we saw and I don't know if you guys have seen it yet but there was a video on YouTube about how differently uh, a white male versus a black male carrying an open carrying an AR-15 in Oregon was treated and, uh, and that to me is the biggest difference. Right. I, I don't think you and I will have this exact same response or a response from law enforcement with open carry of our weapons. And for that reason is why I'm against it. I think it's going to lead to more issues within uh, the black and minority community as how they're treated with guns and with more hostility and potentially a more aggressive tone from law enforcement towards them as they would, would say, you or Lisa or Chris. Mm -hmm. But this, I mean, this is so interesting, you know, how... It, it was, um, you know, African American. As I understand, it was African American uh, representatives agree, joining with the Tea Party folks on that on that element, <laughs> saying, you know, both of them didn't want the questioning, um, and and just how race and you know the history of uh, prejudice has has played into this debate. And apparently, the reason that Texas didn't have open carry was because of you know African Americans and and uh, historically, you know, the leaders not wanting to have black people to have guns, and so it, it's. It's all very complex, but um, I don't know. I think to, to Judge Patrick's question, I mean, there is something different about, you know, I, I grew up in a small town, you know, everybody's got the gun in the gun rack mm -hmm. and, <laughs> you know, riding around and, and it's cool, but there's something different about having, you know, a, a smaller weapon that... Um, it's easily gotten and is not just using for used for hunting and you know, but but then again the idea that, for instance, why why would we have them on campus? The idea that if a Whitman, you know, takes out the gun and starts shooting, that some of these students could stop him, you know, just break into action. It's, How are you going to know who's well, the it's, Whitman? Well, it's probably and pretty f the, a false a false sense of security yes. that they think that somebody who's had who's gone through some. CHL training and some gun training is going to be able to stop a, a madman who wants to take everybody down. But be that as it may, what I want to do now is, <clears throat> excuse well, actually, me. Before we segue to the next topic, uh, Lisa, you kind of mentioned something that I want to ask you a quick question about. Uh, while we're talking about race in the media, do you think, there's been some articles post the Waco debacle up there mm -hmm. linking the way the media has treated the Waco shooting in that situation to the way media treated Baltimore in that situation, mm -hmm. i.e. the way white defendants or potential defendants are treated versus black defendants, rioting versus uh, just being ruckus. Do you, from a media standpoint, from a, a Pulitzer Prize winning professional <laughs> in the media. Somebody who's not been out to Waco and, or Baltimore and can't really g compare those myself. I but, appreciate it. Um, I mean, I think there's no question that there's bias. I mean, I, I think we, we need to just get over that, admit that there's bias, and now deal with it and how, how to how to deal with it, but, but we have so many people denying that, that it takes place. They simply don't realize that we all walk around with biases. And, um, you know, I think historically the media was uh, partly to blame for that, you know, for showing these images. You, you want, I guess, I'm going to get after my people on TV, but my, my colleagues in TV, but you want to show the images that most, you know, get, get your viewers riled up and get them concerned. Mm -hmm. And so you had, you know, images during the 60s, images during the uh, crack epi epidemic, um, where the word violence was equated with a black male. And we are, we are still seeing some of the, um, I guess, the, pro the products of those, uh, right. that media coverage and those kind of campaigns. I mean, it's, it's 
the uh, war on drugs has contributed so much to our image of um, the black males being violent and I don't know I just think that so many of us are influenced by that we don't even realize it when people start realizing it that this is a part of law enforcement every day even the good guys out there who think that they're being fair you know you take these I've read so much about this um, professor at um, University of uh, Colorado he's in Denver and he has an actual, I wish I could remember his website, but he has an actual website that you go to and it's kind of like a video game and you're supposed to shoot the bad guys but not the good guys who may be holding, you know, a bag of something but not a... I've seen it on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> I've seen it <laughs> yeah. someplace else. And it's amazing. I mean, you know, you think that you're an unbiased person and... Quick reflexes get in the way. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a phone call and I want to reset our show a little bit because we've reached 8.30. And uh, the phone number is up at the bottom of the screen, 713-807-1794 is the number. Keep the questions coming in on Twitter, at HCCLA underscore TV, right there on the bottom of our screen. Let's get to our first call. Hello, welcome to HCCLA Reasonable Doubt. Hello. How are you? Uh, congratulations to the county court for uh, providing discovery. That's, uh, that's great. I mean, what else can you say about that? Also, congratulations to Lisa, she, but you'll have to learn how to not crack up when they say Pulitzer Prize winner Lisa Falkenberg. Uh, I noticed y'all aren't discussing your article, which wasn't reprinted in the print version, so I don't know uh, exactly what it's about. Is it still uh, somewhat of a... Uh, doing an article on a secretive subject like grand juries? Are you still under uh, possible legal jeopardy? I'll hang up. Great show. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't, I wasn't aware you were under any legal jeopardy. But. No, I don't think so. I mean, people, um, people have often asked that question whether or not <laughs> I was doing something illegal or, you know, stepping over the line and reporting about the grand jury. But, um, and just quickly, what my, what my series yeah, was we're about. Yeah, gonna, we're going to get to it here because oh, okay. that's the next topic on, uh, on the agenda here is, of course, the, the grand juries. But let's, let's talk about your articles because I, I feel like that's a lot of what spurred the change here in Texas, and that is you wrote a series of articles. Uh, about the problems with the grand jury system here in Texas, um, specifically here in Harris County, and you focused on one case where a witness was basically browbeaten into changing her story by uh, a rogue grand jury is kind of the best way to describe it. Uh, if you read the transcript, Are they all rogue. Well, there's no other way to describe this one other than than rogue, um, and, and a prosecutor who clearly couldn't keep him in check and was probably complicit in. Uh, in, in the brow beating. I mean, um, which one led to the rogue? The yeah, rogue exactly. I mean, the, prosecutor the chicken or the egg, which one came first? But, <laughs> but, but back to you, Lisa. Yeah, I mean, talk about the, your research for that article, what you did, what, what led to it, what got you interested in it in right. the first place? Well, initially it was a, um, <clears throat> what interested me was we had a case, the case of Alfred Dwayne Brown who was um, convicted of killing a police officer and during a, a burglary, and he was convicted and sentenced to death. Um, several years after his conviction, he was um, there on death row, and suddenly some of the attorneys that were the civil law firm working on his case got a call from the district attorney's office saying that uh, a box of evidence had been found in, um, a box of documents rather, had been found in the homicide detective's garage who had, who had worked the case. And um, would the civil attorneys like to see it? Well, yes. And so <laughs> they looked through it. And in there was a piece of paper that basically really supported the alibi that Alfred Dwayne Brown had claimed the whole time. He said he wasn't at the burglary, wasn't anywhere near it. He was at his girlfriend's house at the time and he could prove it. He made a landline call. This, uh, the phone records backed up that he made the call where he said he, he made it at the time he said he made it. And so the, the DA's office, uh, former DA Mike Anderson, did the right thing, quickly said, okay, we agree to a new trial. The judge said, hurry up with it, Mark Ken Ellis. And uh, the CCA just drug their, their heels. Uh, for more than a year, they drug their heels. I wrote a column just saying, stop dragging your heels, do the right thing, give this guy a new trial. I didn't know whether he was innocent or guilty. I just knew that uh, evidence was withheld that shouldn't have been. It was a Brady violation. 
So, time went on. I, th I started thinking, one thing really bothered me is why the girlfriend, who initially had been an alibi witness, ended up uh, testifying against him at his trial. And um, I went to the courthouse, you know, looked through documents for hours, and lo and behold, the last thing I picked up was a big chunk of paper that was a grand jury transcript. Um, and I kind of looked both ways when I, <laughs> and I found it. I'd never seen something like this before, as viewers will know. You know, grand juries are our private secret. And um, so I started reading it. And I, yes, came across, you know, this, this amazing transcript where the girlfriend is threatened, her children will be taken away, she'll never get a job flip, flipping burgers again, you know, every kind of thing under the sun if she didn't change her story, although the way they worded it was tell the truth. I started doing some research. It took me forever to figure out who the foreman of the grand jury was. He seemed to be leading things in the transcript. When I found out who the foreman was, his name, popped it into Google, and quickly got the idea, I had to confirm it, of course, but quickly realized that he was a police officer himself. Mm. So here you had a police officer, active duty, um, presiding over the initial investigation of the murder of his colleague, longtime colleague, a police officer, Charles R. Clark. Now, that's problematic. It's, it's very troubling. What this transcript did, though, I mean, I, I like to take some credit for it, the reporting, but what this transcript was able to do, that even as a reporter, I couldn't have well, done without it. They gave you a Pulitzer Prize, so I think you get all the credit. <laughs> no, I mean, for, 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 thank you for that, but I mean, for the um, actual legislative change that may take place if the governor signs it, it all goes to that transcript. For years, for decades, People have been claiming that the Texas system of grand juries, we choose them, um, we call it the pick-a-pal system, is unfair, that it is vulnerable to abuse, is what the U.S. Supreme Court has said. Lawmakers have done nothing about it. Why? Because they never had black and white proof mm -hmm. well, that there was something, that there was the abuse actually going on. And, and now this transcript from, provided it. A respected person like yourself, because I'm, I'm positive defense attorneys have screamed for years that this doesn't work. No doubt. I'm, you stepped up, right. and, and, and credit to you, mm -hmm. put it out there that, hey, you're, you're just Mm -hmm. reporting the truth, right? Yeah. And you got something changed. So, I mean, I, I think it took something like what you've done to actually show that it's not just us uh, saying the same thing over and over again, that you did something great. So, thank you. We got, a, we got a phone call coming in. Let's jump in and take another call here. Hello. Thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Oh, hey. It's Tyler Flood. How are y'all? Hey, Tyler. Great. How are you? I'm good. Um, I just got a question. You know, after this recent natural disaster, the flooding and the... Um, the major overcrowding at the building, you know, with the um, increased dockets, but even on the every everyday, um, uh, you know, level, there's major overcrowding at this building in the criminal courthouse. Chris, or do you know any plan to solve this problem of this terribly designed building where people can't get to their courtroom on time because um, of the lines outside, of the poorly designed um, systems to get them up to their um, courtroom and bonds being forfeited. I mean, it, we hear talk all the time about, um, well, we may build some elevators outside the building or there's a plan to redesign something. It, it's a major problem. I know you know about it. Um, if the fire marshal would have been called the, the day that, uh, June 2nd, I guess, on, on Tuesday, when everybody was rolled from the flood, I, I'm sure that it would, have, it would have been triple the capacity for that building. Are they turning a blind eye to the fire code? Or, or what's going on with this? Because everybody knows it's a problem. There's lines around the corners. People are, are not able to get into the building on time. People are going to jail if they're one minute late, and they can't get into the building even though they've been standing outside for an hour. I mean, do you know any information and just – that you can yeah. tell us, and, and what is the well, I'll, I'll preface by saying that uh, the district clerk's office is not responsible for the elevators, the doors, and for uh, uh, the traffic flow as it, as it is. But what we are privy to as an office is that the Facilities Property Management Division of Harris County has been studying this problem, and I hate to use that word, uh, for a long time, and they have several options of a master plan, of uh, part of which includes once they demolish the old jail uh, or once they demolish the old family law center, 
uh, that there would be a way to either A, have external elevators, or B, build a new building and uh, uh, put some of the, either the misdemeanor courts in one and the felony in the other and so forth. There are different options on the table. They are pursuing it. Uh, but uh, f several things have to happen first. The remainder of the sheriff's office and the records themselves in the old jail have to move. The building has been purchased and is being renovated off to 5900 Canal. And uh, that is when one option can be exercised. The other option is the Family Law Center location. But first, the Title IV D courts have to be moved. They're the last four courts in that building. And there's talk about moving them to the juvenile building. Uh, but to make a long story short, uh, I am aware that in the immediate future, the goal is to do kind of what they're doing with the DA's office and the clerk's office right now, which is having managed elevators or dedicated elevators for uh, folks that have an 8 o'clock DACA call, folks that have a 9 o'clock DACA call, folks that have a 10 o'clock DACA call, and that the Office of Court Administration is working closely with the judges to make sure that folks that show up for that day, uh, so long as they're within a certain margin, uh, are either A, not forfeiting their bonds, or B, having a workaround so that they can kind of undo the forfeit. Uh, that's again judge specific and I will not speak for any specific judge but I do know that there is a close cooperation with the judges in the office court administration to to handle that because the goal is not to outright punish folks for being late to the courthouse uh, due to things Weather, beyond their control yeah, yeah, any other control but well thanks uh, thanks Tyler for the call I want to uh, get back to oh, Judge Patrick just uh, tweeted in, long-term planning may include decentralized courts like every other big county. So uh, we get it straight from one of the it's judges' mouths right yeah. there. Yeah, could be. That could be interesting if you have to uh, oh, drive out to North Houston or West Houston just to do a court appearance. But let's get back to the grand jury system uh, and, and Lisa's article, of course. You, you called it the pick a pal system. I think the technical term is the key man system. Correct. Um, the, as we know it now. Now, after the law has, uh, is changing, it's going into effect September 1, um, we're going to have grand juries basically impaneled like we would other juries in that it's going to be random. We're going, they're, they're going to draw from the same pool as I understand it. it you can enlighten us a little more, Chris, because sure. you're, you're kind of probably on the forefront of that. Some of the judges were already uh, kind of experimenting th with this already. If you've been to jury duty in the last uh, two to three years, you'll notice that we have a brand new jury assembly room where we've divided it into four smaller rooms to make it more manageable to have separate panels go to the courthouse as the judges need them. And so what would happen is, is uh, if, let's say uh, one of the judges comes down and says, I need a grand jury, it's my turn, we're going to have a three-month session, uh, they're going to need XYZ number of volunteers to come, so we will randomly pick out of the folks that have been summoned that day, uh, 20 to 120 is what the law says, folks to go over to that courtroom and they will go through that process of whittling down the folks that have shown up to be that grand jury. Now, Lisa, this is, I mean, obviously the focus of your article was uh, obviously the impropriety or the perceived impropriety of having a, um, a, an active duty police officer being the foreman of a grand jury uh, investigating the death of another police officer. Are you, are you satisfied that this system is going to, this new system that takes effect September 1 is going to improve it? I believe it'll improve it, but it doesn't go far enough. I mean, we still have a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of issues to deal with. I mean, transparency is one of them. I mean, in Harris County right now, nearly all of the judges are still sealing the names of grand jurors. We have no idea who's on these grand juries, and most of them, it seems, through my reporting, don't have a good reason for it. They just all decided to start doing it, and uh, a few of them have stopped, but. Basically, they're doing it because they can, and there was nothing in this bill that says, you know, the names should be, um, the names should be public. And I guess it's slightly less concern now if we're not having a bunch of friends of the judge's friend, but now we're having random juries. It's a slightly less concern, you know, about the, the being stocked with a bunch of police officers or good old boys or whatever. But it's still, it's still something that that bothers me that their system is not uh, is not transparent.
Well, let me ask. Let me stop you there. What, what's the benefit for having the names of grand jurors disclosed yeah. versus not disclosed? I think that. Well, I would never have known the Alfred Dwayne Brown case. Um, I believe his conviction was in 2006, and um, that was before they started sealing. And I would never have known that the police officer was a was the foreman if his name were sealed. So it's very important to the media. And I think what the judges are saying is, oh, what if we have a controversial case and we're concerned? And um, then you make the decision. You don't just blanket, right. you know, start sealing. And, the, and the, the strongest argument I had for it is one judge told me, well, the defense attorneys were, were sending uh, packets to the grand jurors' homes. I said, well, tell them to stop it. Hold them in contempt. Do something. Don't just start sealing all the names. This is my argument. If tomorrow all the judges of Harris County decided never to appoint another woman to a grand jury, we wouldn't know. They decided never to appoint another African American to a grand jury, we would not know. Well, so let me stop you there because, Chris, how is it going to functionally work? Um, we're going to have a random panel coming in, but how does the picking process work from there? I mean, it's not going to be a typical jury selection where you have lawyers coming in and questioning about who's qualified or who's not qualified. How, do, you, how, do you know how the, the process is going to work in terms of seating the grand jurors? That's a good question. Uh, beyond delivering the panel to the courtroom, once they've, they've gone to the courtroom, they're beyond my control. And so I have not studied that section of the law, uh, unfortunately, for tonight's program. But uh, it, one thing that is clear is that they will be as random as possible to avoid any kind of uh, runaway grand jury and when they're delivered to the courtroom that they will have an adequate number so as to avoid having to have the sheriff go out and fill in the gap which is also provided for right. in the law. But, but to your to your concern, Lisa, and the transparency, and I just want to throw throw this out there, because what Chris has done is he's really tried to make a movement to get people more involved in, in jury service and to come down, show up for your jury summons and be part of the process. And us as lawyers, when you're picking a jury, you stress that and try and, and put to people, you're an important part of the process and the process can't function without you. And I, I want to ask you, you want the transparency, but at the same time, does the transparency, it could have the blowback effect of preventing people from, or making people not want to come down for that very reason, having their names exposed. I mean, it's one thing to be on a jury and then be asked to go on CNN and at your choosing go and do it. But if you're on a grand jury that makes a controversial indictment, why, why shouldn't those people have the right to have their names sealed and, and by choice? by their choice come out and talk. Yeah, I don't think they have any other, you know, right than the, the people sitting in the courtroom uh, in, in the trials have. I mean, those people are, you know, <laughs> sitting in a public room. The grand jurors are not sitting in a public room, but under Texas law, their identities, it's not a question, under Texas law, their identities are public. Their names are, you know, the, the ceremony to where they take their oaths is public in a public courtroom. I mean, the, the law lays out the reason for that, that any citizen should be able to question and ask, you know, who, who are these people? You know, what are their qualifications? Of course, I'm not going to, you're not going to, all of us are not going to sit in the courtroom every time a grand jury is impaneled. And so the practical, you know, effect of this is not going to be these people are hounded to death or that they'll be threatened. I mean, it's simply not happening. If these people were going to be threatened, they would have been threatened through the past century when their names were open. Um, the Houston Chronicle have a clipping on my desk, you know, from decades ago, I think it was from the 50s, where we actually used to publish the names. And these were kind of semi-public public capacity these people were serving in. We actually used to publish the name of all the members of the, of the grand jury. Um, it's not going to happen anymore. Yeah. But if, if if a reporter wants to look at the demographics of that grand jury, um, we should be able to. And another thing is, if you're not going to make it transparent, at least have some kind of reporting requirements of the demographics of the grand jury. So we know these things are following the law, they are diverse, or they're not. And I want to come back to that issue, but I want to take a call real quick because we don't have a caller on the line. Hello, welcome to Reasonable Doubt. Uh, yeah, thanks for taking my call. Good show tonight. Thanks. I have a question for Mr. Daniel. Um, Mr. Daniel, I was in, I was called for jury service a few months back, and I was in there, maybe it was more like about six months to a year ago, and I was in there, and I saw, while we're sitting in the jury assembly room, 
there were some videos played by kind of some public service announcements from different advocacy groups like CASA and some other ones. Um, I have two questions. The first question is, um, how do you, well, do y'all still use those videos? No. Nope. And if so, where do you get those if they don't use those? And the next question is, what about the, the donations that jurors can make to organizations? How do those organizations get selected? By Is it by your office, by someone else? And they is get, there an application process? They apply with my office, but they're actually selected by commissioner's court. And we review and update that list every two years. And uh, the, it's a diverse set of charities, everything from the 100 Club to Crime Stoppers to Child Advocates. Uh, we used to run the videos themselves, and the problem was is that while we had a, a much higher increase in folks donating to these charities, their jury pay, their measly $6, uh, the downside was is that the, uh, particularly the defense bar felt that it was pre-biasing the jurors before they went into the uh, uh, courtroom, even if it wasn't a criminal trial. And so we felt that in the interest of justice that it would be better that we solicit uh, any kind of uh, donations to charities just strictly on the forms that we had done in the past and only uh, either in the jury assembly room itself if they're not picked or only after they have been dismissed or completed their jury service from the courtroom. Thanks for the thanks for the call, and Chris, thanks for the answer. I want to get back to Lisa's point real quick because sure. she was concerned. I want to direct this question to you because she sure. was concerned about the statistics and how would we know about how many women were seated? You know, kind of the, the demographics of what's going into the grand jury. And is there a way, or have you come up with a way that might? answer her question and, and provide some sort of demographic report for the grand jurors? Yes. Under the new system, we already keep track of the demographics uh, and uh, all kinds of different me uh, metadata for the folks serving regular jury duty. And so since they're coming through the randomized system, we would be able to provide that as well, so long as that we weren't in any kind of violation of uh, any court orders. That is great. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know, the next guy gets in, he doesn't agree with you, but right. you're saying it doesn't require you to do it, but you're something you'd be willing to do. Well, we great. already gather the data, so the data is there, there to be right. to, to be gotten. Uh, we just want to make sure we're not in any violation of any court orders. But but there will be no problem with you doing that for grand jurors as well. Is Correct, what you're because they're coming out of the same pot, mm -hmm. and we already keep that demographic information for that yeah. general pool that right. they're being pulled out of, it'd be very easy to extrapolate. Mm -hmm. So, so Chris, does that mean for does that mean you're going to pull a larger larger pool for the you know, jury service? Necessarily, so yes. Right. Necessarily, we'll have to call more people to go to jury service, and therefore our database of available qualified jurors will get dried up quicker. But in the interest of justice, I, I mean, think about how many courts are actually calling a grand jury once every three months. It's not going to be that big of an impact in the overall scheme of things. Chris, we got a question for you coming in on Twitter real quick because sure. it, it harkens back to one of your previous questions to, talking about the courthouse with Tyler's question. And you had said the goal was not to punish people for being late to court. And one of our viewers wants to know whose goal is that? Okay. Uh, the goal is to be to, if you, if you have a court date, and again, I'm, I'm, sp I'm speaking out of turn here because my entire mission as the district clerk is to keep the record and collect the fees. Uh, but it is my understanding, as it's been relayed, because we coordinate all this, is that we're trying to uh, make sure that people show up on time for their court dates and that if they have missed because they're being a scoff law, that, that, that the law appropriately applies and not because the elevator is broken or full. Fair enough. Um, I want to get to another call. We've got another call coming in. Hello, welcome to Reasonable Doubt. Hey, uh, this is Rob Pickman. How are you? Hey, well, Rob, I'm great. How are you? Uh, I like your new set. Thank um, you. We've worked hard on it. <laughs> yeah, it looks real, uh, real nice. So, congratulations to Lisa. Um, I wanted to uh, echo what Lisa was saying earlier, and that is the importance of transparency. Uh, transparency is the key, uh, one of the keys to improving the criminal justice system uh, in Houston and in Texas. If you look at the uh, the history of, of uh, governments where there's a lack of transparency, it's much easier for governments to do bad things. Um, and so uh, when governments are doing bad things, they fight transparency. That's why it's so vitally important that we fight for transparency and support as defense lawyers that we support the press uh, getting as much information 
as they can. That's just a comment, and uh, I'm going to hang up. I well, appreciate the you. comment, well, Robin. I always that. appreciate the call. <laughs> hey, Chris, I got a question for you. Sure. And I'm going to talk about just jury service. Great. Uh, because I think jury service is important, and it's a blend one. How does one get to a jury service? What qualifies you? What can you do to get able to... Excellent question. And uh, this is part of our outreach when we speak to any civic club. Uh, you are pulled from two different databases. One is your driver's license, your Texas identifying card, and the other is uh, being a registered voter. It used to be solely registering to vote, and then people stopped registering to vote because they didn't want to serve on jury duty. And so they expanded it to the driver's license. Now that has its unique problem in that if your name does not match from your driver's license to your voter registration card, there is a chance that you will get called multiple times more than you would have under a regular pool. And this strictly applies to folks that sometimes use a middle name or ha go by their maiden name and not their married name on one document versus another. But it behooves you that when you update your driver's license or when you update your registration card to check the box either on the form or online that will sync the two identifying documents so that you don't get called for multiple jury summons. Guys, I want to go back to Rob. We only have a couple minutes left, but I want to go back to Rob's comment about transparency. Sure. And, and, I, and I want to get, um, you know, the big, the big thing that I see here, Lisa, your, your article was the door that really opened this. I mean, you may not agree with that um, in, in the sense that you know, you, you may not want to take credit for legislative change that may be bigger than what <laughs> you think you're, you know, you really want to take on at this moment, but I really think you did. And what, what I want to know from you is, and we need, we need more journalists like you, but are, are you working on any other investigations or anything that you can share with us that, you know, to help us with this transparency process? Because we rely on people like you for that. Right. So is there anything that you're looking at that, that we need to be aware of, or that the public needs to be aware of, that we can send to you? Um, that you're interested in. Well, I am always looking for <laughs> great ideas, and um, I've got a few things that I'm, I'm I'm kind of interested in. And we got to wrap it up real quick, so. But chop, chop. send your <laughs> ideas. <laughs> but I'm going to stay on the grand jury deal. This law is great, but we need we need to build on it next session. Yeah. Okay. Same question with Chris. Anything to move forward, transparency for the public, criminal defense as well? You have about five seconds to do it, Chris. Absolutely. The more that we make available to the media and to the public at large, the better in the interest of justice and in the, in, in the interest of, of the taxpayer. Cool. Thank you. That's it. Great. Great show tonight. I want to thank our guests, Lisa Falkenberg, Chris Daniel. Guys, thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. Hope to have you on again. Damon Parrish, my co-host, thank you for all you do. It's and we'll fun. see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Always. Everybody, we thank you for tweeting us your questions. Thank you, Judge Patrick, and thank you for all your calls and comments tonight. We'll see you next week right here for Reasonable Doubt. Thank you. Good night.